<laughs> ITX is a thing. That was under my desk. Here we are taking a look at the ASRock Z270 Gaming ITX AC. ITX, the littlest motherboard. Let's take a look at what's in the box and get this thing set up on our bench. Nice, that's what I like to see. It's not a rubber duck antenna, this is an antenna that you can put you know, on top of your case or somewhere that is actually gonna get reasonable reception. So rather than having antennas sticking out of the back, it's gonna be this nice antenna that you can put wherever. Ooh, and it comes with double stick tape, so you can stick it wherever you want. I'm gonna stick it right there. Get a fatality uh, postcard, because postcards are a thing, I guess. Hmm, it's kinda neat. Get a software manual, software guide, and then the full motherboard manual. Got your IO Shield backplane connector with like a plastic overlay. Two SATA 6 gigabit per second port cables. You got your driver CD and your mounting screw for your M.2, and of course the motherboard. All right, let's get this thing on the test bench. Now we're gonna be using a uh, closed loop cooler to see if we can get this thing to five gigahertz. So I'm gonna put my bracket on the back of it. Now there is an M.2 slot on the back of this. So if we were gonna install an M.2 for testing or whatever, we would definitely have to install that before we mount the motherboard. All right, now before I get any further, let's do a quick inventory of the ports and the connections. At the top edge of the motherboard, we've got a four pin fan header, DC and PWM. Then we've got our uh, CMOS battery connector. Now the CMOS battery, because there's not a lot of real estate on this printed circuit board, has to be mounted vertically. So it's just a little bit of double stick tape and a two pin connector. So this is actually a standard CMOS battery form factor. I'm not worried about this. Then you've got your eight pin CPU power header connector, and you've got two more four pin fan headers. Around the front of the board, you've got your dual DDR4 DIMM slots. For air testing, we're gonna be using Trident Z uh, memory from G-Skill. This is DDR4 3200, so this is one of the fastest kits of memory that I have. We're gonna uh, sort of take it to the limit when we're overclocking this in an ITX form factor. You got your 24 pin ATX power connector, a SATA express connector, a front panel USB 3 header connector, your front panel connectors, and then of course our PCI Express by 16. We've got four more, say to six gigabit per second connections. You've got a front panel USB 2.0 header in there. And then coming around the back, you've got your front panel audio connector just behind the analog connections. The back connectors on the board, you've got your two by two uh, antenna 802.11 AC wireless solution, a PS2 mouse, a keyboard port, it's a combo port, two USB 3 ports, an optical SPDIF port, HDMI 2.0 and display port provided by the Intel you know, iGPU, two more USB 3 ports, an Intel Thunderbolt 3 port in USB Type-C. Yes, that's right. This motherboard has USB Type-C Thunderbolt 3. So we're talking 40 gigabits per second or the USB 3.1 provided by the Thunderbolt connection. Then you get your Intel Gigabit LAN, two more USB 3 connections, and your Realtek ALC1220 audio codec. This does use Nishikon audio capacitors. So it's a Realtek ALC1220 based solution uh, and it implements Sound Blaster Cinema 3. So if you're after Sound Blaster or you want Sound Blaster Cinema 3, well, this motherboard implements it. And that's pretty much it for connections. Let's boot it up and test it. Sorry, this is pointing a camera at a monitor. I'm working on getting a uh, USB capture. I had, I had a USB game capture, but it died. So I've got to get a new one. I'm working on that. I should have that by the next time that I review a motherboard video. I hope, fingers crossed. So this is the ASRock UEFI. Um, when you first load it, you know, hey, we get this easy OC option. Sure, let's let's turn that on. Let's see what happens. Hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, I can't really tell that anything happened. Let's go into advanced. Mm, that red and red color scheme. Nice. <laughs> well, now of course the first thing that I'm interested in is going into the uh, CPU overclock, and it looks like we've got some different options here: gear one and gear two. I think these are just really aggressive presets or different kinds of presets, depending on how aggressive you want to be. So advanced turbo gear one is a little more aggressive and gear two is a little more aggressive than that for overclocking. And notice how it, it, you know, there's some red options here and it's like, oh, I can't select those. No, you totally can. It's just red is kind of a warning here. Red doesn't mean disabled. So it's sort of an odd choice on the, on the color scheme. So once you load that, you can look through the rest of the settings and see the presets that it's loaded. But you know, it occurs to me that I have not actually updated the UEFI on this thing yet. So let's go to the internet flash and update the UEFI on this thing, because that is the first thing you should always, always, always do before you start messing with stuff. Cause you never know what they fixed. Most of the time, especially with ASRock boards, you can just 
connect them to the internet and download the flash update directly from the internet, which is a nice feature. If that's not working for you, you can just put it on a USB stick and load it uh, from the USB stick directly from the UEFI. Here are the rest of the settings in the UEFI. Now here's an interesting feature, a riser card. So the motherboard must support using a by 8x8 by riser card. So there may be a case on the market coming up or there may be an accessory that you can order at some point that would take the by 16 slot and give you a riser card of some kind that would give you two by 8x8 eight by eight slots. Um, there, there is mixed support for that on some boards. Sometimes you have to have like an active adapter and sometimes you have to have a passive adapter. This looks like it's going to work with the less expensive passive adapter, which is really good news if you're looking to, you know, squeeze two expansion slots out of an ITX system or use a custom case or something like that. Now, curiously, Thunderbolt was disabled in the UEFI on this motherboard, which means the USB Type-C port at the back will only function as USB Type-C and not Thunderbolt, I think. So I went ahead and enabled that. You also have the option of security levels. Now this is really important to understand because there's sort of a nuance about Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt provides direct access to the system bus. And so if you have a rogue device and you plug it in, it could read system memory, it could do all sorts of crazy stuff. This has been a security problem for years. Uh, all the way back to the original Thunderbolt. Well, Intel's kind of mitigated that in the chipset now. And so you can have user level authorization where a user has to approve the Thunderbolt device. And so the UEFI gives you some hardware control of that security context. That's what that means. Of course, this UEFI also has a board explorer. And because we've got that M.2 slot on the back of the board, you can see the back of the board in the board explorer. If you're not familiar with Board Explorer, it's a, a graphical representation of the peripherals connected to your motherboard as seen by your motherboard. So when you add peripherals to your motherboard, plug RAM in, whatever, you can come into the UEFI and look at this graphic and it'll show you what the motherboard thinks is plugged in in the various locations. It's really handy for troubleshooting. The fan tuning function, of course, will ramp up your fans and try to figure out what sort of control your fans require, whether it's DC or PWM, and set the control curves, the calibration curves for, you know, what voltage means your fan is off, what voltage is your fan spinning at a minimum RPM, because a lot of fans have a minimum RPM where even though the fan is getting energy, the fan will not spin unless it's getting a certain amount of energy. It's not, you know, your fan control is not linear control from zero RPM up to 1100 RPM. It's typically like you know, five, 600 at the low end, and then, you know, 1100 at the high end, because other, you know, less than that, there's just not enough energy there to get the fan started spinning. And so this will figure that out and use it as part of your fan control profile. Of course, if you prefer manual control or control through the graph, well, you've got fantastic tuning, so you can totally do that. You can also make the fans respond to different thermal inputs or thermal sensors, depending on if it's the CPU zone or the motherboard zone. Now for stress testing, our five gigahertz overclock, I'm gonna use eight to 64 and just uh, keep an eye on the temperatures and you know the other stuff. Now we are using a dual 120 millimeter radiator for our overclock, which is a little unrealistic on an ITX system. But look at those temperatures. Those temperatures are actually really, really good. So we're running at five gigahertz on a 50 multiplier, 100.2 bus speed. And I really haven't experimented with this very much at all. Our core voltage is 1.376, so it is peaking a little bit. I did set it at 1.35 in the UEF5, but of course, you know, it's not an exact science. I might try to back that off to like 1.32 or 1.31 and see if I've still got the stability that I have. But the temperatures are looking really good. No thermal throttling. Everything is looking good here. All right. Seems like we've got a stable overclock in Windows. Let's boot into Fedora and see how stable we are there. I'm going to run the terminal. Now, I've already configured this installation of Fedora 25 to turn on the Intel IO MMU group so we can see what this motherboard looks like as far as PCIe pass-through goes. So let's do a quick LS PCI and see what's going on as far as the PCI bus goes. And then here's a quick look at the IO MMU groups. I've got a handy script somewhere that will automatically map the PCI device IDs to their actual devices from LS PCI. But for now, you'll just have to eyeball it on the screen because I was in a hurry. A quick check of Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, wired Ethernet, and sound shows that everything is working exactly as it should. And that's not really unexpected. I mean, Z270 really is just an incremental improvement over Z170. It's really more surprising if something doesn't work than something does work. Because, you know, Z270 is really just Z170 plus a little bit. And of course, here's a quick look at the I.O. regions. So the Z270 Gaming ITX AC, it does what it says. I really can't find much to fault it with. The presets on the CPU for the overclock really are the most aggressive thing, and you've got some different options there. The UEFI does support overclocking in terms of an offset mode, but it also, in, uh, it also supports overclocking where if you set the voltage 
um, to be higher than stock. It'll only run the CPU at higher than stock voltage when it's exceeding the design frequency of the CPU, meaning that your CPU will run at stock voltage up to 4.2 gigahertz. And then after 4.2 gigahertz, it'll bump up the voltage, which is really the best mode of operation. But you've got to fiddle with the UEFI a little bit to get those settings. Nevertheless, five gigahertz, stable, heat wasn't too much of a problem. I think this deserves a really close look. So I'm gonna use this motherboard for a special project. Yes, that's right, take a look at this. You guys remember this? There's a video coming up and I'm gonna put this motherboard and I'm gonna find something for the cooler, something that'll fit in this case, but that will provide adequate cooling. I may have to get creative, but you'll have to stay tuned for that video. That's coming up. If you pick up one of these or you're thinking about picking up one of these, let me know. If you picked up one of these and had a good experience, you know, let us know in the forums at Level 1 Techs. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there.